1170 WCLN 1170 Radio and Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Welcome back, folks. Uh, we're on the air today, and we're uh, coming to you from Star Communications Channel 16, WCLN Radio. I'm often asked, uh, where can I hear your program, or where did we get We Should Know? And those are the two primary venues. The show's also uploaded to social media platforms as well. Uh, I want to kind of get you to focus with us for a few moments today uh, about a number of subjects that is very and mostly critically important to our children and to the growth of all the areas in the state of North Carolina, and that's public education. And someone that has a background in public education that's been there and done that is Dr. Wesley Johnson, superintendent of Clinton City Schools. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you've uh, you've been a teacher. You've been a uh, principal, assistant principal, assistant superintendent, and now superintendent of Clinton City Schools. And most of that journey, or in fact, probably all of that journey has been right here in a, a rural county in eastern North Carolina. Uh, we're going to hopefully get into a lot of subject matter about uh, somebody called Rob Leandro. But before we do that, I want to open today and give you an opportunity to comment uh, on post-pandemic behavioral health and um, what you see with the folks that you cater to on a daily basis, and that's students. Um, how is the stability and behavioral health from where you view uh, our students today? Well, I would say that a lot of things have changed uh, in the world of education since, Leanne, uh, since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we hear a lot of talks and questions about learning loss. Uh, and I do believe that there has been some learning um, time that has been lost, learning time that has been lost. Uh, but what we have seen uh, really is a lot of unique needs that have bubbled to the surface. They probably have always actually been there, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. JW. Uh, but, you know, just now with us starting, I guess, to enter the recovery phase of the pandemic, um, it's been an opportunity to see you know, things for the last two years and the perspectives that we've had that there's been a lot of adjustments that public education has had to go through, a lot of adjustments that our students have had to undergo, a lot of adjustments that our teachers and staff have had to undergo. Um, and when you talk to mental health, um, you know, most people don't do well with change. And the world of education has drastically been altered since COVID-19. I mean, you know, it, you go back to March 13th, 2020, when we were found out that we were going to be sent home for what we thought mm -hmm. was a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. ended up being several months. In fact, throughout the entire uh, the rest of that school year and the summer. And then many school districts were not able to return. Uh, thankfully, Clinton City and uh, the work that we did and our staffs and our custodians and our nurses, you know, we were able to come back on a limited limited basis, uh, but we did have a lot of students and a lot of parents that felt that they, for safety reasons, that they needed to remain out or to remain virtual. And so there for a while, for almost right at a year, a year and a half, we had some students that were virtual. And I think that education has always been a uh, stability uh, for uh, young people. They have, uh, I know I'm a creature of habit mm -hmm. uh, myself and having the opportunity to have a schedule and to, uh, you know, have a time that you've got to wake up and a time that you've got to go to this period or this period or this classroom, I think is really a good thing. Uh, but when you don't have a schedule and when uh, the world basically shuts down on you for a while and, um, you don't have an outlet, I guess is, is what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, things start to creep in and you feel isolated mm -hmm. and surrounded. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there have been a lot of um, mental health uh, things that, like I said, have bubbled to the surface. Uh, thankfully, uh, in Clinton City Schools, uh, we uh, have a social emotional core curriculum. Mm -hmm. We treat it just like a part of our reading, writing, math, arithmetic. Mm -hmm. It's called the Jesse Lewis Choose Love. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that as part of our core curriculum, uh, pre-K to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we really focus on social emotional needs and concerns and trying to address those for all of our students, not just uh, after we uh, establish that there's a concern, but again, it's part of our core curriculum that all of our students are being taught, uh, you know, 
what isolation can do to a woman, the benefits of uh, talking and conversing with others. And when you have a concern or a question to bring it to an adult or to a loved one. And so I think, think that those have really helped Clinton City Schools uh, to uh, maneuver uh, during this pandemic. I, I, and I want to uh, pick up on one thing you said with that particular course. Is that something that is an elective and is it something unique that you guys have put together or is it something that other schools are using? So uh, it's a it's a core curriculum. Uh, Jesse Lewis uh, was a, uh, a young man uh, that was killed uh, in a school shooting mm -hmm. uh, and his mom wanted to uh, have his name to live on. Mm -hmm. And so she started this program. Uh, there are it's mm -hmm. pretty well pretty widely known. It's actually a free program mm -hmm. uh, that um, the, the the family and, and the people who, who love, uh, you know, uh, Jesse Lewis put together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we teach it not as an elective. Um, we have time that's built into the instructional uh, day uh, and um, it becomes part of our core curriculum. It's different, of course, at, sure. at all five schools, uh -huh. uh, but uh, it is time that we find in, in part of the regular school day to infuse the concepts of social emotional learning, uh, character education, uh, you know, the golden rule, doing, mm -hmm. doing things for others instead of yourself, and that we're really working hard to ensure that our students get those, get, you know, get that part of their uh, curriculum. I, I look. I look at a lot of school systems uh, throughout the state, and one of the things that that we're seeing it is there. There seems to be a correlation uh, in many areas with the crime rate and activities uh, outside the classroom and that kind of thing. So when we're talking about this behavioral health piece, it it, it comes to mind to say what is the the school's role in moving forward with not only the course you're talking about, but other related courses that deals with behavioral health. I read an article a while back, it talked about students not only feeling marginalized, uh, but didn't feel like they were included. So inclusivity becomes important, but there's something else going on in communities, especially communities where we see there's a lot of uh, substance abuse, there's uh, 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 deadly force being used, and all these kinds of things is bubbling up in the community. What is public school role in addressing that? It, it, do you see that as out of the parameter of the public school, or does the public school have a role in giving that child uh, a sense of purpose? Well, you know, thinking back to an old adage, it takes a village to raise a child, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and then uh, one of the things that I've always really been a, 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 an advocate for is loco parentis. Uh, you know, when, when, when a child is under the auspices of the public education, we're like their parent. And so from uh, 745 to 305 or 8 to 230, depending on what school you're in in Clinton City Schools, uh, basically uh, the court system gives us loco parentis. Mm -hmm. You know, we're mm -hmm. to be uh, like a parent to that child. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've always seen my role. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as you said, when I was a teacher, when mm -hmm. I was an assistant principal or principal, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to treat your child any different than I would want my child mm -hmm. treated. And now that I'm a parent of three children who all attend Clinton City Schools, you know, I expect and I support uh, those teachers that teach my children to be in loco parentis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are to be responsible for working with them in all of their health needs and concerns. I also think about, uh, you know, um, when you think about the different um, educational psychologies and how a child needs to be known that they are uh, loved before they're going to give you their respect, you know, yeah. you don't, you, you don't, you don't necessarily, you got to give respect to get respect. Mm -hmm. I think is very important, and so you got to meet a kid's uh, social emotional needs first. You're never going to get a child to what I think they call self actualization, right, okay. a, a, unless they know that they are. And so that's why it, the public education is responsible for feeding kids. That's why we're responsible for showing them love and empathy so that we can get them through those lower levels and up to this um, 
this level of learning, self-actualization, because if I don't meet their basic needs and they come to school hungry or they come to school with social emotional concerns, how am I going to teach them how to do complex problems in like calculus when they get to the 11th and 12th grade? So I've really got to work hard uh, and all of our staff has to work hard to meet those lower level needs so that they feel loved, supported, cherished, nourished, so that they can move on and, and reach those higher levels. I, I want to kind of inject this and we, we might need to uh, follow up on it when we come back from break. but. Uh, I often hear this deflection by, and of course you didn't do this, but sometimes educators will deflect it and say, well, the family needs to do so and so. This is a family issue. Uh, you took it on in your commentary just then that this was their family, that this this is what we do. Uh, you didn't do that, but but as you know, what I'm saying is true. Oftentimes folks oh, yeah. say, well, if they get it right at home, if they didn't do this or didn't do that, we wouldn't have to deal with it. That doesn't seem to be a challenge for you. You're up for the game. Well, I think so. I mean, I, I, I just think, you know, I just know my own family. And I mean, of course, I love my, all three of my children, but uh, the, the, their teachers probably see them more hours of the day than I see my own children. And so they're uh, investing into their lives and they're helping them. And so, you know, you think about college and career ready and you hear that a lot. But I think about college, career and civic ready. It's, I mean, if, if I'm raising the next lawyer or the next doctor, but I've not infused them into civic responsibilities and principles of how to be a good citizen, have I really taught them anything? And so that's really what I think about a lot. And so when you think about all those needs and making sure that you're meeting those basic needs of survival, I'm never going to get them to learn unless I meet those needs first. So I think it's very important that we meet those at the public education level. We're going to take a, a quick break. When we come back, I want to segue uh, our conversation here in this first segment. I want to segue that over to Leandro versus uh, North Carolina, which has been around for some time, and it lets you kind of walk us through that process. I think we're at a critical juncture now in education that it needs a review from a local superintendent's eyes. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with Dr. Wesley Johnson, Superintendent Clinton City Schools. And we're talking about a number of issues. And when we come back, we're going to address something called Leandro versus North Carolina. Stay tuned. Let's get out of here. Protect what matters most in your life with security from Star Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for being with us today. The name of the show is We Should Know. I'm J.W. Simmons, your host. It's always a pleasure to be here each and every Tuesday at 2.30. Uh, we come to you on Star Communications Channel 16 and 316. Also, WCLN Radio. Our guest today is Dr. Wesley Johnson, Superintendent of Clinton City Schools. Uh, Wesley, you did a great job in, in getting into that discussion of behavioral health and, and students' needs uh, uh, from your perspective and background as a teacher. Uh, principal, assistant principal, assistant superintendent, superintendent. I, I can think of nobody that hadn't seen the crevices of, uh, of public education more than you have. I want to segue into something that's been going on now for 20 plus years, and it's called Leandro versus North Carolina, and uh, started out uh, in, in Hope County. I want you to walk us through that in 1994 uh, and give us a, a glimpse of what the particulars were uh, and and who is this guy, Rob Leandro, anyway? I mean, everybody refers to it, but sometimes we get lost in thinking this is something that occurred with a person that's not really this person. So I'm just going to give you the mic for a moment and let you walk us through that. Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. J.W. Well, of course, um, you know, like you say, I've been in education for quite a while. I actually started in 98. Uh, and so I'm finishing up my 24th year in public education, all in Sampson County. So 20 plus years in Sampson County schools and uh, now three and a half, almost four in Clinton City. So Leandro versus North Carolina, I've been hearing about it since I was basically in college and in education type mm -hmm. courses. And so at the time there were a group of, um, public schools and boards of education that felt that they were not receiving equitable school, uh, public school, um, public schooling, uh, that, that then their, 
than their competitors or their uh, advocates or other uh, areas of North Carolina in five counties. Uh, and those five counties uh, primarily uh, were Buncombe, uh, Wake, um, Forsyth, um, uh, Mecklenburg, and I'm leaving one out, um, Durham. And so these other 95 counties, primarily uh, from Eastern North Carolina areas, uh, sought to really, again, find equitable education. This started uh, at that level. Uh, they uh, filed a lawsuit. It eventually went to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And basically that's where the, the, the two areas kind of differ in is really the Constitution of North Carolina giving um, all public schools in North Carolina in the 115 school districts, because there's 115 school districts and 100 counties, are we really talking about equal and equitable public education or what later became the terminology that Leandro was based on, sound basic education. Mm -hmm. So there was a difference between really what the plaintiff sought for in the case, which was equitable education, mm -hmm. and then North Carolina basically uh, sided it with the sound basic education. Again, uh, as we think about uh, those areas uh, that were uh, that, that that, that were really seeking this, um, and you, you named Hope County. Uh, Cumberland was one of the plaintiffs. Halifax. Halifax, I believe, Vance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, again, they were looking for uh, this, this equal education with those five counties that we've already talked about mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. the wealthy counties at mm -hmm. the time. And um, the first named plaintiff that you mentioned uh, was Rod Leandro. Uh, he was an eighth grade student at West Hoke Middle School at the time uh, in 1994. And, um, you know, I guess his mother felt like that he was not getting an equal education to these uh, more wealthier districts. Um, and so we like you said, we fast forward to now 2022. Uh, Rod Leandro is now a, an attorney. And he's mm -hmm. an attorney in Raleigh. Uh, Rob was actually able to graduate from Hope County Schools. He earned a four-year uh, scholarship to play football at Duke University. Uh, and he went on to be a fairly successful lawyer mm -hmm. currently in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know we, we'll get into a lot of questions about sure. finances sure. and all that sure. in a few moments. But that's kind of the basis of where this uh, this where it started. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, there was a lot of discussions again, but primarily what we're talking about here is equal education versus sound basic education. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think it, you know, in, in this document uh, uh, is put together by West Ed and some others. And, and when you look at this, folks, I, I see this document as being uh, somewhat a sense of, of a guide, but it does get down to the I guess to the complexities involved. It, it's now, when I look at the amount of work that has been done uh, by some obviously very smart people right. doing very detailed surveys, it is tremendous in nature. So why after 20 plus years, uh, I guess 23, 24, 25 years doing the math, are we really still talking about this? Because there seems to be a, a constant pull between the legislative branch and the judicial branch as to the responsibility of who is it that actually pulls the trigger. Obviously, legislature holds the purse strings. The courts and uh, the judicial branch uh, says, to your point, this is a constitutional, North Carolina constitutional must Tell, help us understand why this complexity and why these, this headbutting keeps going on. I mean, we're talking about $1.97 billion. <laughs> right. That was only to fund the first two years of the Leandro West Ed mm -hmm. comprehensive uh, plan that was put forward. I think, Mr. J.W., in order for us to talk about that, uh, we need to ensure that our viewers have a, a sound, basic understanding mm -hmm. of school finance. 
And so uh, I think that's very important because uh, most uh, citizens don't understand how school finance is determined. And it's basically determined at the local level by your county commissioners and, uh, of course, uh, others like the state level, of course, you know, they have some, uh, uh, you know, guidance on the, the state funds and all that. And so basic when it comes down to school to school funding, school finance, there are three big pillars. You've got federal funding, you've got state funding and you've got local funding. And what's kind of um, strange about school finance, you can't like move money from this pot of money from federal to state, state to local, just can't do it. So there's a lot of quote unquote red tape to school finance. And so you get pots of money from the feds, you get pots of money from the state, and then your local kicks in and can, depending on your address, depending on your zip code, those, those, those monies that are kicked in locally can be substantially different. Mm -hmm. We're talking about as much as six, eight, ten times different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in Sampson County, just to you know, just to kind of give you an idea of where we are currently, we're about twelve fifty, one thousand two hundred fifty dollars per pupil. That's the per pupil rate. If you went to somewhere like Chapel Hill, uh, Asheville, you're probably talking nine, ten thousand dollars per pupil locally. That's a huge difference. Yes. And so, of course, not that money solves every problem because it doesn't, but to know that I'm able to spend eight or nine times more per pupil out of local funds than I could if I own a person who lives in Sampson County or Clinton City, that if I live in Chapel Hill or Asheville, uh, of course, you know, that's a lot more that you can do, a lot more programs you can provide, a lot more uh, extracurricular activities, a lot more social emotional coordination that you can do. So this really the, the, the grand scheme of what Leandro is really about is really about school funding. And, and that's kind of a, uh, to your point, an equity issue as well as an equality issue. So when you look at school systems like Durham, for example, or if you look at school systems, uh, I say Hope County or Sampson County, is that the leverage we need to be able to say, look, the legislature or the judicial branch needs to come together and determine that there is parity involved? And, and how do we do that? Um, as citizens, you mentioned our viewers and listeners. Well, what is their role in this process? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, basically, the basic core of again, Leandro, at, at, that was you know discussed and that eventually became a part of the uh, the the hearing again was sound basic education, mm -hmm. and that's what all of us have an entitlement to in our constitution. Is everyone is entitled to a sound basic education? Uh, and that was really the difference that was found is we're not all entitled, according to our court system, to an equitable education, but to a sound basic education. And then uh, it was determined that individuals, uh, students of those school systems, many Eastern North Carolina systems had not received a sound basic education. Uh, and so those are why some things happen with pre-kindergarten uh, and some ways that school finance uh, uh, happened with some at-risk dollars. And so the, this, this, this terminology was coined about what is an at-risk student? Uh, and so uh, then it became that all at-risk students should have some uh, additional funding or some disadvantaged funding that they could be sent to assist with their needs uh, because in these other areas of North Carolina, maybe the students weren't as disadvantaged or weren't as at risk. And so that's really where, you know, this kind of meets the, the road at. And, and what I'd like to do uh, when we come back from this break is is kind of dig into that financial piece a little bit, too, and, and talk about how did it how did it come about uh, that there is an analytical difference financially between schools, say, in Sampson, Bladen, wherever county versus some of these other counties that get as much as five or ten times more. So I think that's important for folks to understand. There are differences that exist that literally says to you as superintendent, 
I only have this much fuel. These folks have this much fuel, so they can go a lot of further than we can. I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as right. I can understand. Right. And so uh, I want to kind of touch on that when we come back from this break and maybe give people uh, a, a little more in-depth understanding because the language that's going on now is more accusatory. Yes. So we'll be, we'll be back in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. Stay tuned. Just because something may work doesn't mean it's right for your business. Let Star Communications knowledgeable consultants help you customize a hosted voice system that's right for you. Our dedicated experts work with you to understand your business needs and guide you at every step from choosing and installing services to ongoing maintenance and support. Contact Star today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Wesley Johnson, Superintendent of Clinton City Schools. Uh, background is uh, pretty extensive in public education, Dr. Johnson. You're well over your 20-year point now, and you've you've pretty much done it all when it comes to teaching, to administering, uh, to looking at it from various angles, uh, from classroom to superintendent and the things in between. As we went to break, we were trying to create a a conceptual understanding of how we end up where we do with the amount of money in our pocket that we have and what role do we, and when I say we, I'm saying as my listeners and viewers, what is our role in this process uh, to help you? Because we, oftentimes I think most folks that know you as I do will say, you know, this guy's doing everything he can for our students. So I wanna know what you need from us as a collective to help you move that needle more that helps benefit our students. For me, <laughs> my grandchildren, for, for me, I look at it and go, wow, you know, uh, and we haven't got into a lot of things, particularly private schools. Right. So we can add that on as a caveat at the end, but let's just address that, that funding issue that you talked about a while ago. Well, yeah, and, and, and like I said, I, you know, it's, <laughs> You, you get you get money that's basically all every state is going to every county is going to receive state money. And so when you think about that, that that money comes on a per pupil uh, rate. And so is it equitable? Sure, it's equitable when it's initially sent down from the state. That second part that we talked about, Mr. J.W., was the money that's that's provided uh, by our local uh, county commissioners, mm -hmm. and that's not to to throw anyone under the bus, or, or but uh, you know we are very appreciative of the money that we get from our county commissioners. And that money has actually increased for the last several years. And so I'm very thankful to have a very supportive uh, county commissioner group. Anytime we need something, we go to them. But again, when you don't have the tax base of those wealthier districts, and they've got so many more things that they can provide, so it really comes down to what you're saying there with resources. And so you think about like things such as uh, class size and class size are capped at certain numbers. We basically divvy out our teaching responsibilities just like the state sends us. We divvy out our resources just like the state sends us. But if you have nine or 10 times more uh, money locally and I can take instead of having one teacher for every 25 kids, I can have one teacher for every 16 kids. And so when you've got more resources that you can infuse into the, uh, into the classrooms and into the classroom environments, you can hire more teachers to be interventionist. You can hire more guidance counselors. You can hire uh, more, um, you know, social emotional coordinators. And so they, these wealthier districts have resources that are not available uh, or not available to that scale uh, that they are to uh, areas that are not quite as rich in, in, in funds. And so that's what this whole issue is in regards to. So what can we do on the local level? Uh, you can continue to advocate for public education. Uh, you know. Uh, I think many of your viewers uh, probably were educated within Sampson County and Clinton City Schools, and they probably uh, appreciate the education that they were provided. And I can tell you, as being someone that's been in this business for almost 24 years, all within Clinton and Sampson County Schools, 
we have some great teachers and some great educators doing some great things for great students. When I think about what's going on in our school system, uh, in both school systems, I know that there's many wonderful things. I see many uh, uh, students that were graduating that are prepared to go on to these next levels. I had a student last year that got a full ride to Duke University. I got a student this year that's got, uh, well, two students this year that have full rides to East Carolina, another student that's got a full ride to North Carolina A&T. And we've got all these students that were graduating who are fully prepared to go on uh, to not only college, but career, workforce, military, but again, if we had additional resources and we could provide these supports uh, that some of these other districts are able to do, what could we do these things? And that gets my mind thinking, what could we do with eight or nine or 10 times the amount of resources that we could provide to our students? And because are there students that do fall through the, through, the, through the cracks? I think that we would have parents mm -hmm. and listeners that would say, absolutely. But if we had those other resources, would it be possible that we wouldn't miss any child? Mm -hmm. And so when we think about things such as no child left behind, that's mm -hmm. really what it was all about. Mm -hmm. It's not losing any child, you know, making sure that every child who starts in pre-K or kindergarten is afforded uh, the education that they need to reach their maximum success. And that's what we're about here in Sampson County and Clinton City Schools is to ensure that every student that, op that begins and graces our doorsteps is, is provided the education that they need to reach their ultimate success, whatever that, that is for them, whatever their family chooses that they want them to do or to, uh, to strive to be, we need to be doing that for them in, here in Clinton City. When I listen to you, I hear a lot of detailed information and I hear a lot about the structure that exists in North Carolina. Is there a need to rethink or reimagine our structure of education, particularly the way finances flow? Do, do we need to look at that, not only from a state level, but as you pointed out a while ago, on a local level and even on a federal level, uh, based on what that dynamic is and rethink the whole structure? Because you got the uh, boards of education that, that are key advocates for education in each one of their districts, so includes uh, Clinton City Schools, they're key advocates. But yet, as you pointed out, the, the purse strings financially is not held by them. They can do proposals, but beyond that, that's pretty much where that boundary stops. So I would say yes to that question, that I think there definitely needs to be some investigation into a different model for funding public education. I mean, that has been, that's really, what Leandro is all about is how should schools and public schools be adequately funded in North Carolina? Again, not equally funded, but adequately funded so that you don't have uh, students going to schools in uh, certain parts of the area uh, that are going to schools that are 100 years old, uh, that don't have centralized heat and air, uh, that have possibly asbestos you know, in those locations, and other people going to schools that they never go to a school that's older than two or three years old because they're constantly building and mm -hmm. moving students around. And, uh, and so that is something that we have to consider. Uh, but I do think that um, through Leandro, um, North Carolina, although it's taken us quite a while, 1994 mm -hmm. to 2022, I do think there seems to be, uh, Mr. JW, in, in my career, there seems to be a little more um, momentum Mm -hmm. For what I'm seeing now with, with uh, how public education is funded, there's a lots of uh, there's lots of people talking about this issue uh, as we are here today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think that I see uh, a bright future for public education and hopefully for funding and uh, maybe a change to how we structure funding here in, in North Carolina. You've, you've seen the model work. You've seen the model not work. And, and again, we talked a bit about the, the role of the, the educator, the people that work within the system. Uh, we've recently seen over the past six months and maybe even eight months, uh, a lot of pushback of what folks are willing to work for financially. Is that something you're seeing within our local systems now, not just necessarily Clinton City Schools, our, our educators and bus drivers and folks that keep the buildings clean? Are they saying, look, we got to have more and we're, we're willing to do some extreme things? Um, well, you know, we have great people again, Mr. JW, who are working extremely hard. All of our bus drivers, our cafeteria, uh, 
our cafeteria workers, our custodians, they do a fantastic job. And should they get paid more? Absolutely. And uh, of course, in North Carolina uh, this year, uh, we were asked uh, or mandated to move everyone up to $13 an hour. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. And next year, it's going to be July 1st. It will be $15 an hour. And uh, you, we were able to provide with a lot of resources that were sit down for COVID relief. We were able to provide a lot of additional supplements uh, for not only our classified staff, like our, the people that we're talking about, but also our certified staff and our teachers. And there were lots of bonuses that were infused. And, uh, and sure, uh, the, the people that were on the front lines, and that was the word that kind of came through COVID, our frontline workers. Mm -hmm. And of course, these individuals that were there in the buildings and making sure that the buildings were clean and properly sanitized, you know, those were very important roles because without those, without these type of workers, we would not have been able to hold school. And they were doing it, uh, you know, late at night and to ensure that our kids could come back to school in a safe environment and an environment that was virus free. Uh, so of course, I think that they do deserve more money. And are, are they asking for more money? Well, they should be, mm -hmm. and they are. And uh, the good news is, is North Carolina is starting to provide some of those resources. And again, the COVID relief funds really assisted us with that as well. I, I think the, in one important piece is that this process, as we look at funding too, uh, there's supposedly a lot of funds that the feds pumped into yeah. states. Uh, and, and I'm told that there's still some funds that are existing in baskets in different places and in categories. Have we expended those funds? And I'll give you about 30 minutes on that because we've got to break, uh, 30 seconds on that because we've got to go to break. But is that those funds being expended and or are they being held back? So we have until 2024 to uh, to to get to get through <laughs> yeah. all of those funds. Mm -hmm. But no, you're, you're exactly right. We are uh, we've got a plan. Uh, we've developed that plan with a lot of uh uh, a lot of people that assisted with the development of that plan, and we are in the process of getting that money out to our schools, getting that money out to our uh, faculties and staffs to do great things as they are. When we come back from break, I, I want to kind of uh, set this up for our last segment is to look at Leandro uh, in the sense of what it does for the outreach of the school. That is a school that is a school beyond the hours of the structural building. And I think that's to me is a piece that's not only exciting, but, uh, but has a lot of possibilities for discussion. So uh, we're gonna take a break and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Dr. Wesley Johnson, superintendent of Clinton City Schools. Key issues facing you, your children or grandchildren or in some cases, you could look at it like you and your future. We'll be back in a moment. To get the most out of your electronic devices, you need a strong internet connection and a protected home Wi-Fi network. You need high-speed internet from Star. Star has the fastest, most affordable high-speed internet service available for all your devices. We have no long-term contracts or high-pressure sales. Our service speaks for itself, and switching is hassle-free. We take care of everything with free installation from a local company. High-speed internet from Star. Internet at the speed of life. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take a moment to thank you for your recommendation, suggestion for shows. Uh, we Should Know has been on the air for a number of years now, and we, uh, part of our survivability has been your input and your continued reflection on shows we've had, suggestions, comments about shows. Uh, your emails is very important to us. We Should Know, edu at gmail.com. We Should Know, edu at gmail.com. And we also still get some notes or comments via mail, regular mail, also referred to as snail mail at post office box 1482 Clinton, North Carolina. That's 28328. Please continue to do that and we'll try to respond to those and also follow up on the uh, recommendations you've had. Today we're talking with Dr. Wesley Johnson. We're talking about education. Uh, Dr. Johnson, we're coming up on the last segment and I, I always, when, when you're on, I'd Again, like to do a semester with this, but unfortunately we can't do it. There's a part of this uh, funding and a part of I think what Leandro is speaking to that funds and funds allocation sometimes addresses is those things that oftentimes people look at it as auxiliary efforts in education. Things that happen beyond the eight to three range, uh, things that happen, whether it's sports, uh, whether it's um, challenges, uh, uh, beta club, whatever it may be, 
how does how are we impacting that? And the the other thing I want to talk about in this last segment is the the whole idea of private schools, of which we have in this county and throughout the state. Address that. There's always this reflection: Is my child or my grandchild going to get a quote better education in a private school? So let's start with the auxiliary part first. Sure. Um, so uh, that's a big part um, of public education, of course, and one of the reasons why I'm in education, to be quite honest with you, Mr. J.W., is uh, I, I like comprehensive. I think they call it, you know, that's what, that's what we call them, comprehensive high schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so a comprehensive high school goes above and beyond the basic needs of a sound education, as we were talking about here with Leandro. But it gets into things that you're talking about, and it gets into the athletic piece, and it gets into the piece of the the beta clubs and the uh, National Honor Societies and your uh, your arts programs like your band and your chorus programs, theater arts, and all of these, again, are rich in Clinton City. We have some fan fantastic educators and coaches and of course everybody knows about dark horse football Mm -hmm. and now everybody's learning about dark horse soccer Mm -hmm. Um, but you know when you think about the resources again and i and i know i keep coming back to that but when you think about having eight or nine times the amount of local money that can be pumped in not only to help with reading writing and arithmetic but that can help with your band programs. And now you can hire specific individuals to help with the color guard, which is, you know, like the the individuals in the band Mm -hmm. that have like the flags and they're twirling the flags. And you have specific people that can assist with that. And because basically how we have to do that within Clinton City, and I always kind of like to bring it back to the local perspective, we have to use our parents. Mm -hmm. So our parents have to become our band boosters. And then we put that on the backs of our parents and we put that on the backs of our students that they have to go out and sell band cards. Thinking about the soccer team, we got to go out and sell $25,000 in cookie dough Mm -hmm. uh, or t-shirts or have a dark horse day camp so that we can just break even. And then you think about just like me, I I mean, I'm a competitor. I don't want to put uh, a band program out there or I don't want to put a football team out there if we can't be competitive and compete Mm -hmm. with everybody in the state that we're Mm -hmm. we're asked to compete with. So because you have got to have the equipment to go with. Right. So we've got to put the resources into making these things successful. And again, we do a great job and our our local providers, our, our, our county commissioners, but then again, our parents and our ones that are going out and selling these band cards and selling the cookie dough, they're doing a fantastic job to give our kids the, the best opportunity to be successful, uh, just as much as these other areas that have all the money that we've been talking about. So, so when I hear you talking about this, it, it appears to me that, that we've transcended beyond the walls of the school that we're we're now talking about education as something that that I look at and I, and I think about and, I, and I'm thinking it's, it's about expanding the mind. But at the same time, that phrase could be extended and say expanding the mind, nurturing the soul. You, you're actually reaching into the, the heart and soul of that community and family and nurturing that to give them a broader scope of thinking skills. Absolutely. And so, you know, everybody like I, I think everybody does. I, I do. I enjoy the, the part of being a community school and that I like seeing our community uh, to be involved in the things that are going on within the school. And so, we again, you know, talking about the band program and mm-hmm. uh, of course, education is vital. And we know that raising a uh, raising an education, educated citizenry is very important. And again, we have loads of uh, loads of uh, parents that are involved in the day to day affairs of our schools. But on a Friday night uh, in the fall, in a crisp Friday night when we can go out and the whole entire dark horse stadium is full of fans cheering us on. Sure, I'd like to see that on a Monday through Friday uh, that we have that many people cheering on our students mm-hmm. to learn. Mm-hmm. But we know that uh, that you know when it comes to things like that, that we've got a lot more not only families, but not only uh, moms and dads, but aunts and uncles and grandmas that that like to go out there and watch mm-hmm. and cheer. And so that really makes it a community feel. So, so basically, I'm, I'm hearing you say that if we could get folks to understand. Uh, that they're co-owners in this process. They're they're people that literally own that building, that own that process, that 
on, they they carry part of that weight, although you're the kind of the head of the spear, but they carry part of that weight of moving it forward. Absolutely. And again, we've got a very, very great community that really uh, gives above and beyond uh, to Clinton City Schools. And anytime there is a need, we have a large group of sponsors. I think about our sponsor walls that we have at our athletic fields and they're just laced and loaded with uh, individual names and also with corporate names. So we've got a lot of sponsorships and that's well appreciated here in Clinton City Schools. And I do think that we try to as much as possible to uh, to coin that term that we've already talked about, that it, raises, it takes a village to raise a child and that all of our community and all of our uh, parents and supporters are doing a great job with infusing our students with a sound basic education. With that said, uh, I want to segue to uh, uh, private schools. As you know, there's a number of private schools in the state and doing quite well. And right. A lot of students attend those, do outstanding jobs. Uh, how do we continue to, even if there's a need to balance that between private education, public education, and the one word that is constantly pointed out is now the legislature looks at voucher, a voucher system, if folks is not satisfied with Clinton City School or some other school system that they can get a voucher to go to a private school. What do you see the structure and relationship of private versus public education? And that may be way more than we can get into. So. Right. And so, you know, um, that's, a, that's a pretty tough question because, you know, uh, uh, thinking about private schools and private education and privatized education, which some actual states have gone to a model mm -hmm. that they're privatized and there is really no public school. Sure. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I guess there are families that feel like that they need uh, a private education for, for their child. Um, you know, my only hope and desire and wish is that they would give us an opportunity to uh, showcase what we can do and the talents that we have in Clinton City Schools to get our students prepared for the next uh for, for what they're going to tackle when they when they graduate. Um, you know, so um, there are a number of families that choose uh, our private uh, schools in, in our di in the district. And so, um, you know, I would say, again, uh, to come and see the great things that are going on, have conversations with uh, other members of your community, uh, talk with your uh, fellow teachers that you know, talk with your principals, talk with uh, your board of education members, talk with me, and I'd be glad to uh, showcase the great things that are going on here in Clinton City Schools. Public, public educators and private educators as well, the job responsibility. I mean, you've, you've been there, you've, you've been in classrooms, you taught in classrooms. Do you ever kind of reflect and say, if I was selling this to somebody who was going to work for a corporation, how would I sell them on this idea that they're gonna be known in the community, that they could be stopped in the grocery store and ask questions, uh, they gotta relate to 30, 40 children in the classroom every day. Uh, how would you look at that and say, how do I entice them to be part of an education system that now is going to impact their lives 24 seven? Well, that's easy for me. Uh, <laughs> I think you can tell I'm pretty passionate about being an e educator. Uh, it's what I've devoted my whole life to. My wife's an educator, uh, but the, the benefits you reap from being a public school edu educator or even a private school educator, that you know that you have the opportunity to mold the future generations, that you have the opportunity to infuse uh, concepts into students that are gonna make them to be great, whatever they decide to be, mm -hmm. that they decide to go into the workforce or education or military, you're inspiring that next generation. So it, it, when I was a building level uh, person, if I was a teacher or an assistant principal, principal coach, whatever I was doing, that was my goal. My goal was to inspire that next generation, to get them excited when they came into my classroom or when I had the opportunity to even work with them a little more close as, as a coach or, or as an assistant principal, principal. You know, it was to inspire them. And I would always in, in, try to work with them and teach them in those teachable moments. And so I think Think about when I was a high school principal and you're dealing with very impressionable young men and women ages 14 to 18, maybe even 19, and you're really trying to help shape and mold them into being these young adults. And that was just a great time in my life and in my career uh, to really focus and help them focus on what they needed to do for the future. Dr. Wesley Johnson, I want to thank you for being with us today and thank you for dedicating your life and service to education. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as we go to our final break, I want to remind you of, of where we are and what we do here. It is education information, and it is on Channel 16 and 316 Star Communications and WCLN Radio. It's also uploaded to YouTube and various other social media platforms. So we enjoy seeing you each and every week, and we hope you enjoy seeing and hearing us each and every week. And please continue to communicate with us. We should know edu at gmail.com. We'll see you next week and may God bless. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion regarding this or any episode, please send your emails to we should know edu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.